This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead, and that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. It was probably even though he was celebrating Easter, he wasn't worried about Easter. He was worried about Passover because he had to give the outward appearance to the Jewish people, although Herod himself was a pagan. Just want to say. But listen to this. Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly the unleavened. He's talking about the feast of unleavened bread and Passover. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Therefore what? Now, Paul, you know there was this big Catholic council. And they determined, many of them at the end of a spear, because of Constantine, that it was illegal for a Christian to celebrate Passover. What was the penalty? Death. What that means is a whole bunch of Christians that refused to come under Roman rule for, the, for their walking with God were still celebrating Passover. You fast forward several hundred years and the Roman Catholic Church had to once again put forth an edict Christians, if you celebrate Passover, we're going to hunt you down and kill you. Well, Mark, I'm Baptist. And I, we can trace everything we do back to the Anabaptists. I'm glad you brought that up because the Anabaptists kept the feast. That was the ones that the Roman church was reminding them that they had better quit doing the feast. Because Constantine set the plumb line. Let us have nothing in common with the Jews. He said, let us not keep the feast, not with, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, but with the new, not, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness. So he was saying, what you're trying to bring into the assembly that they do down at the temple of Diana is what? Malice and wickedness. Don't do it. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Look at the example of Jesus. Jesus was the unleavened bread. When you get grafted into him, you become unleavened. Don't let this stuff back in. The feasts are all about Jesus. And so when I, I have Christians ask me, do I have to keep the feasts? They're all about Jesus. Why wouldn't you want to? It's not add-ons that was added centuries later by the adaptation of pagan ways and putting a Christian veneer over the top of it. You will not see the Apostle Paul saying, Oh, by the way, because of the time of year, I wish you all a Merry Christmas. In fact, the reason that we sang songs about the birth of Jesus, it was during the fall feasts that he was born. And I guarantee you one thing, he would not share his birthday with Apollo, with Baal, with every pagan god, Every male pagan god was born on December 25th. Huh. 
I kind of wonder if we could actually go back in the annals of time. I wonder if that was also Nimrod's birthday because it all kind of stems from him. But I cannot say that conclusively because I wasn't there. Okay, nobody wrote it down. These Moadim are appointed times of God that God promised to meet with us. Well, if God promised to meet with us, why would I not be there? You know, when the king sets an appointment, it is beyond rude not to show up. And then we're constantly begging him to show up when we decide to have our meetings. Did you ever notice when you, when you keep the Sabbath, it's, it's a lot easier if you do the spiritual warfare right, it's a lot easier getting the presence of God in. God, he's already here. It's his day. This is the Lord's day. And if you use the principle of first mention, out of the Old Testament, because that's where all the first mentions are, then there's no biblical evidence that it ever changed. Otherwise, there would be a massive treatise written by the Apostle Paul or somebody on how it all changed. They're divine rehearsals. The, the, the interest, I love the way God works because the moment that God said light be, he created time, he created the temporal dimension, and he filled it all. And so at that moment, it was a done deal for him. How many know the Nechesh in the garden didn't throw God off? Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. So before the earth was ever framed, God already had the plan in his mind and the moment he said, light be, he worked the entire plan. And so, Isaiah 60, 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. That's why so much of understanding the book of Revelation, you must have to go back to the book of Genesis to truly figure it out. That's why Jesus pointed back to it and said, it's going to be as the days of Noah. And boy, you start digging that, that thing's a deep well. Nobody wants to go down hardly. All except for people like Tom Horn, Steve Quayle, and a few others. And I mean, they, they have an express elevator they have built over the years. That is a deep well. Why is that significant? Because I see the world marching to it in an unprecedented pace. Transhumanism is nothing more than Genesis 6 out of a test tube. But he doesn't stop there. He says, now I'm declaring, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that have not yet been done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. There are several things that I have personally in my own prayer life that I've done is I've started talking to God about his pleasure and not mine. There comes a place in your maturity that it stops being all about you. In fact, that's when, if somebody has been wounded and they're going through counseling, the, the mark, the delineation mark when they begin to really show progress is when it becomes more about those around them than it does them. It is that way with any healthy relationship. As a little kid, what is it about? Me? I want my stuff now. I want my food now. You know, a baby doesn't care if it's 2 o'clock in the morning if they wake up hungry and wet. They're not going to sit there and say, I'm going to give mom and dad a break today and I'm just going to lay here in all this and I'm just going to sit here with my belly griping until about, you know, give them, you know, 2 or 3, I'll, I'll give them to 6 o'clock in the morning. I'll wait for the sun to start coming up before I start crying. No, it's me. Me, me. Something happens about puberty, and it first starts happening when you start noticing the opposite sex, and all of a sudden, whoa, them. <laughs> what, what makes them happy? There's an old country song that says, I don't want to talk about me. I want, I want to know your favorite things, your favorite song, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. As a Christian, the mark of moving into maturity is when it becomes the Lord's pleasure. It becomes his will. Yeah, Lord, I got all these things I want to do, but since you're the king, I lay them down at your feet and say, what you need me to do, I'll do. See, Mike, why is that important? That's how you get into the inner council of the king. So many are still sitting on the outside looking in because they're all worried about what the king can do for them and not what they can do for their king. 
Oh, that is, that is extra. That is not in my notes. But I want to go back to Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 21, because this is where we are. You see, Tom Horn called it right when he said, when he, when he had us all con, uh, come together and collaborate for the book Blood on the Altar, because there is a coming Christian versus Christian war. And the difference are going to be the remnant and those that are getting ready to get broke off. Well, Mike, my Bible says once saved, always saved. No, it doesn't. Your doctrine may. And you don't even know the amalgamation that created that. There's a guy named D.L. Moody. Baptists in America were all Armenianists. In fact, there's one group still called Free Will Baptists. They promote the free will because they were opposed to Calvinism. And Moody was an Armenianist, and he gets over and starts fellowshipping because of a revival that broke out. He was invited over there, a revival breaks up, breaks out, and he begins making friends with a guy named Charles Spurgeon and the Calvinists in the UK. Now, he remained a starch Arminius on the front end. Won't you come? Won't you come to the altar? We have informational literature, you know. You see, that? You see the altar call is anathema to a true Calvinist. Well, you're trying to do the work of God. Who do you think you are to assume that you know what you're doing? So, he kept the altar call and won't you come? Anybody that wants. Now, the, it's wide open on this end. But once you get in, we got you and you can't get out. Because he liked the Calvinist that grace was irrevocable on the other end. And so he took two opposing theologies and went like this. And we called American Baptist theology. Don't you believe in the security of the believer? Absolutely. The devil cannot take you out of the hand of God. But the word is very clear. You can walk out of it. And there is a difference. And don't send me emails about that. I will not answer them. I got enough going on. Okay? Verse 21. If God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, severity, but towards you, goodness. If, underline that in your Bible, if, if is an ignore, is an enormous word. Sometimes kids don't catch this. If you do your homework, if you clean your rooms, if you be good, you'll get this. And all they hear is, and you'll get this. They don't hear the if. The worst thing that a parent can do is not enforce the if. Because it will teach them that ifs don't matter. And they'll do it to the Word of God. But I got my Willy Wonka golden ticket. Let's see how far that gets you in heaven. God doesn't care about chocolate or Willy Wonka. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. But the Apostle Paul believed once saved, always saved. No, it doesn't sound like that here at all. The devil can't pull you out, drag you out. Get you mixed up and you accidentally walk out. That's called being backslidden. How many know when a believer's backslidden, they're the most miserable person on the planet? And the Holy Spirit starts working them with a plan. But what we have in the book of Hebrews, you deny Jesus, which is what that, that is the unpardonable sin, denying Jesus. Because in the back, back in the synagogues, they already begin, re, they begin disavowing Jesus. And so if a Jew wanted to come back in the fold because they were ostracized, they had to get up before the synagogue and say, Jesus was a sinner and he deserved to be crucified. He's not the Christ. The apostle Paul, I believe, 
In the book of Hebrews says, when you do that, it is do not pass go, do not collect $200, you're going straight to hell, and there is no sacrifice left for you because you denied Messiah. And that's literally when Jesus said the, the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost will not be tolerated. It's in context, context, context with them rejecting his anointing because Messiah means the anointed one. They were saying everything he did, he did by witchcraft and demons. And Jesus says, you believe that, you're going to hell. Okay. How are we cut off? We set up another Jesus and make it an idol in our lives. We replace the Word of God with doctrines of men. Traditions can be good, but if they're not founded in the Word of God, they can be very, very bad. Because if our flesh likes it, we will take tradition over the Word of God. Well, Mike, how do you know that? Well, I'm going to open up this can of worms. If I had a dollar, just a dollar, for every time I heard, you're not going to take my Christmas, I could take everybody out to Olive Garden and pay for it. But see, did, did, you, did you hear the phrase, my? You see, I'm interested in the Lord's days. Now, you can have an annual chili cook-off, Invite all your family and give them gifts and whatever you want to do on your chili cook-off. But don't act like it's about the Lord. It's not. It's your chili cook-off. And we got to be careful that we don't end up with him saying, you're doing your feasts and I can no longer tolerate them. Ouch. I'm going to try to get on. i got nine minutes. Otherwise you will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in, if they, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in. How many know that we're seeing Jewish people come to faith in Jesus in an unprecedented way? I love reading the stories of Zev Parad over in Israel and how many leading rabbis that he's leading to the Lord. Not only that, but the Holy Spirit right now is after the sons of Ishmael in a major way. I mean, he's showing up to them in dreams and saying, I'm not the Jesus you were taught, here's who I am. And I mean, it's being surrounded by miracles. I mean, he's even waking up imams and saying, I am Jesus of Nazareth, I am Almighty God come in the flesh. No, by the way, although Allah didn't have a son, Yahweh did. And I mean, it's getting so bad that Al Jazeera is complaining on their national, regional television that so many Muslims are becoming Christians, and what in the world are we going to do about it? <laughs> so look at the dichotomy of the Laodicean church in America, that in the Middle East, Christianity is exploding where it's being persecuted. In China... It's growing at such a rate that if something doesn't happen, the Chinese government, the communists, will find themselves in the minority. That's why they're trying to make Christianity illegal. And if, you're, and if you find out your neighbor's a Christian and you don't report them, then you can be put in jail. Why? They're seeing the handwriting on the wall. Let's go on. We'll be grafted back in, for God is able to graft them in again, but if you were cut off out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted in contrary to nature into the cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own opinions that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Now, you've got to stop right there. What's he talking about here with Israel? I just got grafted into Israel, and there's blindness in part. 
he was prophesying about the days ahead when the church, when the Gentiles, and what is called the church, would be absolutely ignorant of Moses. We know who Jesus is. We're ignorant of Moses. The Jew is supposed to know who Moses is, but he's rejected Jesus the same way he rejected Moses. Moses doesn't live up to our theology, and Jesus didn't live up to theirs. But you know what? We're entering into kingdom, and when kingdom begins manifesting, the blinders come down on both sides. That's why we're having Jews and Ishmaelites are accepting Jesus in an unprecedented number. At the same time, the remnant is waking up and finding out, hey, there's stuff here before Matthew. I wonder what it says. I wonder if the Apostle Paul knew about this stuff. I don't think my pastor does. Poor early church. All it had was the Tanakh to work from. And the Holy Spirit and the revelation of who Jesus was, but they were able to turn a pagan world upside down. And the church divorced from the Old Testament, or as one preacher says, that we were unhinged from the Old Testament. In Acts chapter 15, I'm thinking, dear God, what version is he reading? I read just the opposite. The last command to the Gentile church is learn Moses. You know what we've done? We've been a brat about it. If they told me to do it, I ain't going to do it. They could take the Old Testament and they could make Jesus come alive in such a powerful way that Gentiles would leave everything that they have known their entire life. They would leave their gods. They would leave their pagan ways. And they would adopt the things of the kingdom of God and embrace this man named Jesus who was Almighty God come in the flesh. I dare you to try that out of the Old Testament without opening up one New Testament scripture. We can't do it because there's something wrong. But when we get into the book of Revelation, they sang what? The song of Moses, the faithful servant of God. You mean in one of the last books written in the Bible, Moses is the faithful servant. Well, maybe John didn't read the Apostle Paul. He penned this 30 years after the Apostle Paul went on to be in glory. And at the timing of God, God had John exactly where he needed to be to write the book of John, Revelation, and 1 John. One is so that you might believe. One is so that you know what in the world's going on or going to happen in days ahead. 1 John is to get you ready for when the prophecy starts hitting the fan. The king is making announcements. Those announcements are, it's all about my kingdom. The kingdom is beginning to be enforced in ways that we have never seen since the book of Acts. The remnant that will submit themselves to the reign of the king and the reign of the king alone will begin moving in his kingdom authority and power like we have never seen before. I love the way the book of Acts is penned. Unlike the book of Revelation, now they kind of added the, the end, you know, there. But and when you look at writings and, and how when you're writing, in it, you're writing a treatise like he did to the faithful, because that's another way of interpreting Theophilus. It's either his name or the name literally means those that are faithful. The book of Acts doesn't have an end. What they need to add is to be continued in a future generation. And guys, I think we're about, I think this generation is about ready to walk into it. But it's got to be because we have learned to hear his voice. It's not about me. It's not about my stuff. It's about the king's rule and reign and his agenda. Winning men into his kingdom and teaching them to walk in the kingdom and to disassociate themselves with mystery Babylon. Because our mindset has got to be king 
and kingdom and how I serve my king faithfully in his kingdom. I don't tell my king what to do. My king tells me what to do because he's king and I'm not. And I'm learning how to be a warrior priest in this day, in this hour, in his kingdom. Now, Father, I ask that you would loose a fresh anointing on every single one of us. That we would cease being something man-made and to be walking, become walking in the kingdom and that we would become your faithful subjects, your faithful servants in the earth. That you would release an anointing and the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn out mystery Babylon and to burn out f- selfishness and carnality. Father, let us be set free of those things so that we can serve you in a way that is pleasing to you. Never burdensome, but to become a delight to your heart. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it today. In Jesus' name. The fallen immortals that rule the kingdom of darkness have enabled the esoteric societies that control this world to nearly fulfill Nimrod's dark directive. They have taken society down the Luciferian rabbit hole into a technological matrix of darkness. But the Almighty will not allow the enemy to bring his demonic forces for the final showdown without raising up one of his own. God is waking up people around the world who are shaking off their techno-sorcery-induced spiritual slumber and are answering Heaven's call. There is an end-time empowerment coming for God's remnant and it is beginning to unfold in our day. It is time to awaken, be empowered, and become the Sheerith in this generation. The Sheerith Imperative is a must-have tactical manual for God's remnant in the last days. Get your copy at KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. Hell may have its directive, but heaven has its imperative. Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store dot biblical dash life dot com that store dot biblical dash life dot com